Okay, um, so I have, now I have lots of people here. Hang on one second. Uh, so I had Wendy and I have Leah. So, but I want to um, now move into the general discussion for this session. I want to thank Melissa and Nancy for really thought-provoking talks. Um, but I want to back up to the people that were in queue. Um, so Jose, and then Peter, and then Calum, and then Wendy, and then Leah. My question was related to one of the first uh, slides of Melissa, in which uh, you show that change from 20% of explanation to 80%, uh, adding the animal models. Do you think that this is just redundancy within the human genome to cope with those changes or with those mutations? I, I do think so. I mean, I, I, when I include the GWAS data in that value, it goes up to about 40%, but then those are, you know, less causal mutations than rather association. So um, I think there's a variety of things. There's tolerance. There's which mutations do we actually have. So in the models, there's often, um, you know, there's uh, a lot more, you know, full gene knockouts as opposed to single variation types of studies in the more historical data that's changing over time. But so I think, um, so there's a number of different reasons why that's, um, why that's the case. Um, with some of the studies that we heard about this morning, obviously, we're going we're gonna to start, you know, closing that gap um, much sooner. So so, um, yeah, kind of spans the spectrum. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, too. Yeah, awesome talk, Nancy. I just wanted to add that we, we did a pilot project in, in where we used text mining to get HPO features for common disease, and then we compared GWAS hits with, which are mainly upstream or downstream of genes, with Mendelian diseases, and, and there's a massive overlap if you just say, can you find one HPO feature that's common to both, so that would also support what you what you're showing I think within within every sort of common disease um, consortia there's an emerging observation that the Mendelian subtypes that there's often common variation affecting the regulation of those that you see that you can see associated at the GWAS level you know as, as you build out to larger and larger sample sizes and and we're definitely looking at those same kinds of things, but of course, when there are many phenotypes, you, they can be associated with multiple. Just, just really quickly, because it's related to both of those uh, um, points. So the other thing that we didn't really talk about was the use of um, the interactome data or um, pathway data, so to crosswalk across those phenotypes, so if you see um, connections between those, and we've tried, we've had some efforts to integrate those as well. Sorry. <laughs> From Cal. So I was just going to tie a couple of comments together. So for example, the Palmer hyperkeratosis is associated in syndromic disorders with a risk of sudden death. If you actually start to measure Palmer skin conductance in everybody with heart failure, it turns out you can actually identify uh, a quantitative association with ventricular arrhythmias in, in baseline populations. So that sort of highlights how having quantitative rather than semi-subjective is, is actually quite important, but also that the, the semi-subjective can inform where we need to go for some of the proximate phenotypes. And I actually like Nancy's concept of axes. I think you can imagine that there are some very th clear thematic axes that we've, if we were able to develop uh, translatable phenotypes in that small space to start with, then you can imagine doing everything from the uh, massively parallel mutagenesis all the way through to um, massively parallel clinical phenotyping with the same end phenotypes. And that's, I, I think, something that, that might tie the, the whole thing together, or at least part of it together. Great. Wendy? Uh, so I'm following up on um, some comments and questions uh, for Nancy's presentation, and uh, I think before Howard mentioned it, I had the word Onferoni in my mind, but, uh, you know, I think he answered that great, and, you know, I'm not one to, <laughs> to question, but, uh, uh, so, but the, the zinc um, idea, the hypothesis, um, certainly ties in with a way to, um, to test this biological plausibility. Uh, because obviously you have, I think you have access to those patients, um, and to the extent that maybe some of those phenotypes are modifiable in adult age, you know, you can sort of talk what I think Callum was saying earlier is, you know, you have a, a biomarker, and then you have a treatment, and then you have etiology, so. 
the, the skin conditions are the obvious place to look first because I think those probably will clear um, with zinc supplementation if that is indeed the driving biology. Probably the diarrhea, gastritis um, too. You know, whether brains in adults will be as amenable to the therapies as, as brains in children were, it's hard to know. But, but I think clearing the skin is a really good first start, yeah. Yeah. Nancy, do you see, um, because the GTEx is done by RNA-seq, are you seeing any missense mutations in those genes um, that are also associated with these phenotypes that could be less serious or maybe a little, like just the protein is just a little bit broken? <laughs> well, so one of the things that we're hypothesizing, so for some of the Mendelian genes, um, we see really strong additional phenotypes, um, and frankly, in some of the, the Mendelian disease genes where there are particularly common mutations, and we wonder whether this is an, a kind of an interaction between being a carrier and having reduced expression. Um, so we'll try to get at that through, through sequencing. Um, the, because GTEx is GTEx, and that's where we build the predictors, I mean, we don't have transcript levels in the patients and subjects. But, um, but yeah, you can, you can sometimes pick up the, uh, and we've got whole genome sequencing. I mean, we'll know who's got, who's carrying mutations in, in any of these genes also. So Nancy, I, I had a question. So your, your presentation was kind of like a, a Julia Child show, right? You, you gave us this beautiful end product to, and demonstrated how to use it, but I'm wondering about how you put the ingredients together, so that real the, the fundamentals of the data integration, how easy was it for you to pull together the different kinds of information you needed to build the resource? What were the challenges that you faced? And we're, 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 we'll be building it for a while. So, but the, I mean, um, BioView exists, and the, you know, remember, Vanderbilt has a 41-member Department of Biomedical Informatics, so the, the phenome data has been through a lot of layers, um, even just in the synthetic derivative. And the, the opportunity to, you know, we, we can go across these FIWAS codes, um, and for any of those, we can dive deeper with a 95% sensitivity and specificity diagnosis if we want to be sure that, that this is dilated cardiomyopathy or primary pulmonary hypertension showing the highly significant associations and what was the particular acute kidney failure associated with the zinc transporter. Those kinds of things, you know, we can work with 41 member Department of Biomedical Informatics to get highly specific um, diagnostic algorithm codes together. But so, so there was, so a lot of the infrastructure was there. The rest of it, you know, really comes through GTEx. We've been working in GTEx for a long time to develop methods to integrate data from GTEx with genome variation to give people better tools for making discovery. And this is one, you know, sort of just the latest example. But I think applying it in BioView where you've got the whole phenome is a really special and attractive application. I think the, the sad thing about that is not everybody has a 41-member <laughs> biomedical <laughs> informatics department to work with, so. <laughs> I know, right. Um, so, you know, so part of it is getting to, you know, what are the lessons learned that, that could stimulate activity initiatives across the community to make doing what you're doing easier. Kind of like, so, you know, Melissa was talking about standards for encoding and exchanging data, the need to develop that. Do you, do you have any insights into those kinds of recommendations for how to make what you're doing easier for the broader community? I think one of the things that we, that we really need to work on, and, you know, maybe with, for example, Melissa's group, is the, the ways that physicians can describe the phenotypes they know about with patients so that it's easier to see, you know, what possible genes come up in the context of 
you know, first figuring out what the, the genes might be. And, but even those, you know, getting the, the phenome in is a challenge, and that's been something that's been interesting to look at from the perspective of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network and, and all the, the effort that goes into even figuring out what patients should come into those programs who can't be just diagnosed based on, you know, what they have. And enriching the ability of clinicians to see potential other phenotypes that might associate with known Mendelian diseases, I think, is, is key. But getting that information readily available in, in forms that physicians can use this is going to be a, a challenge. But I think there's some things we can try to do that in that direction. Um, Melissa, and then Mike, and then Cecilia, and then... Um, so just a couple words on that. So one thing is, is that, you know, um, in terms of crossing that translational divide between the basic science researcher and the clinician, um, you know, so that we, we and others have tools to try to help do that. They're imperfect. Um, we, we definitely need more user interaction and development on those things. But I think, um, you know, more, th more than that is tools to understand the fact that we are simply never going to record phenotype data in, in the clinic the same, with, with, at the same degree or in the same ways as we do in the model organisms. And that's where the ontologies can really help with visualization tools that can help s see that this patient is similar to this worm because, you know, clinically, if you're reading PubMed, it's really, it's really hard to look for those similar phenotypes, but if we have better visualization tools to help, you know, immediately show, yeah, that actually is kind of similar, then, that, then that's another way um, that we can do things. And then the second point is um, that, you know, many of the people that work in our kind of space, the 41 bioinformaticists in your department, you know, we're, we're often um, at a, last, last, uh, a lack of um, access to patient data, to sample data, to try the algorithms and try the tools and clinicians who are willing to try those things. Further, you know, we go about our business and, and you know, building these data pipelines and data structures and data models, but then the next person goes and builds their own ones that, in a slightly different way and has to rebuild that road every time. So how do we better share the process of making these connections, not just the fact that we have the data? Great. Mike? So one of the things I heard from Nancy that intrigued me is this idea that protein coding Mendelians may also be interacting with regulatory um, variants for this the same gene. And we've been talking about second site mutations or modifier mutations or variable penetrance at this meeting and it comes and goes. And, and that just reminds me of the initial characterization of retroviral oncogenes where initially people looked for the protein coding variants, then found some of them were regulatory only and then surprise, surprise, found out for some both regulation and the protein coding mattered. Do, do you have a sense now of how common those three cases are? So we have to really look across all tissues. I think some of the, some of the genes that have low coefficient of variation where we don't tolerate a lot of variability in its expression, um, also the, e even if it's highly heritable, we may not get outside the range very much. Um, and so for, the, for a subset of genes, we actually see no phenotypes associated with reduced expression of the gene. It just may not be tolerated. And, but for those genes, there are some bad things if you have too much. And I think that was one of the, um, to me, a little bit surprising observations. When I, we pull together the genes that look like Mendelian genes in waiting, there's a, a couple of dozen of them that are already Mendelian genes with really rare recessive um, phenotypes associated um, so with loss of function, but increased expression of those same genes is associated with congenital anomalies, intellectual disability, and, and other bad things. And so gain-of-function mutations or, for example, structural variants that might take out um, regulatory elements for those genes that would lead to their upregulation um, will look like a, a Mendelian disease for sure. Cecilia and then Barbara. I wanted uh, to ask Nancy, going back to the comment you had about um, specificity and sensitivity, 
Um, and also, I guess um, Howard had a question or comment earlier with regard to, um, you know, how, how, how specific is the diagnosis or how accurate. So I'm wondering whether, um, I think the tool you presented or the integration of all this data is really powerful. Is there any way to show what the specificity sensitivity is moving forward so that one has an idea, um, you know, what, what's the overall accuracy um, with the approach? Well, so, okay, so I presented two genes that have very dramatic associations. I could have presented thousands of genes that had no associations. So I don't want you to get the idea that I got a lot of genes at 10 to the minus 19. I don't have a lot of genes at 10 to the minus 19. Um, and, um, and yet, uh, unquestionably, the Mendelian genes do attract a lot more phenome. Much of the phenome they attract are, is the part of the phenome we already know should be attracted, but, um, but there's some new phenome also. Some of it does come in in these axes, so I think, you know, the axis that the zinc transporter is on, this wound healing and innate immunity, it involves kidney failure, it involves um, some of the primary pulmonary hypertension. These are things I've seen with a number of genes that show associations not as dramatic as what we just saw, but, but significant, at, you know, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. And, and so this notion that, you know, we sit on these planes and rock back and forth, depending on the environmental exposures and the whole set of genes that we have, I, I think is, is real and, and that we, there's a lot we can do there. With respect to, yeah, we're looking at high throughput zebrafish, cell-based assays and, um, and mouse studies um, with a lot of the novel findings. But I'm not going to take the, I mean, there already are mouse models or sometimes zebrafish models and Drosophila models even for some of these Mendelian disease genes. When I see the same phenotypes associated with the Mendelian genes for reduced expression as with the disease, I, I think the model is <laughs> complete. And I, I'm looking then at the novel associations for, for validations. And we'll have some quantitative um, description of how many of the novel genes with associations that we put through this we can validate. Um, but again, you know, with strict Bonferroni correction, a lot of these will definitely meet that criteria. And we don't have that many that are so dramatic. So we'll go to. Barbara, and then Bruce, and then we, we actually have to wrap it up because we have Bob online for the uh, next talk. I'll be quick. Um, so Carol, you mentioned, um, you know, how applicable is this to people who maybe don't have access to a BioView, and there's something that Nancy didn't talk about really with relation to the um, imputed gene expression, and that's that if you have whole genome sequencing or if you have genotypes and cohorts, you can impute the expression in many tissues that have been surveyed by GTEx, and so you could imagine in a case control study, you can impute cases and controls, find out which genes are genetically predicted to be differentially expressed, and learn potentially about causal mechanisms for individuals you don't have the transcriptome data for and that wouldn't be affected by their other phenotypes. And those and, models and, exist. Those yeah. models exist. You can and go it's all online publicly and, available. Yeah, it's all publicly available. All publicly. Bruce? Yeah. So there's been a lot of discussion actually just in the last few minutes and for that matter even in the last day or so about all the, the things we wish clinicians would provide in terms of phenotypic data, but they don't. And it just strikes me, maybe speaking in a way on behalf of the medical genetics community, which could be the source of a lot of this, there's a small handful, probably many of whom are in this room, who think in these terms, and then a very large number where that's completely foreign territory to them. But I think you would find, actually, that there's a high level of interest and willingness to participate. And I guess I would just propose somehow that we come up with a way to reach out to that larger community and try to engage them. And I think you would find a lot of willingness. There's not, it's not that people don't want to put phenotypic information in. And I would even argue, actually, some of the discussions about IRB or other um, constraints are somewhat overstated, actually, I think. Um, a lot of the, the patients I deal with would love for us to share their information in the hopes of coming up with better data. 
But I, my point is that I think there is a large, small army actually, it's probably not large, but there at least is a small army of people who would be willing to participate if we could reach out in a way that would break what I think is a bit of a Tower of Babel of all the various databases that we've been talking about. Well, and maybe I could just comment in response to that, Bruce, um, uh, hoping that, that you and, and others, um, uh, Gail and, and Mark and, and Mike and those who are, you know, heavily tied into the ACMG community will stay, you know, if you can, through the, through the discussion um, in terms of next steps. Because one of the things we see as really, you know, useful would be going back to the ACMG and, and, and really trying to, to make these links in ways that make sense to the average clinical geneticist, not those of you at one end of the spectrum that are they're here with us. I just wanted to make a, a sort of an observation of a paradox and um, the people sitting around the room who come from the model organism community will know that there's been a lot of concern lately about how model organisms are going to be funded going forward. Uh, Eric and other NHGRI folks, this is for you as well. Um, you know, so I think today we've seen a really great uh, demonstration of the value of the data that's collected by those databases. So I would just urge that we make sure that we don't break something that's working really well going forward. Yeah, I wanted to um, add on to what uh, Bruce had said. I mean, uh, one of the issues uh, with any request from clinical data that we've heard several times already is um, you know, what's the value for the additional work that I'm going to do? Now, the reality is, is that um, in the context of ordering genetic tests, um, many of the companies are now requesting relatively sophisticated phenotypic information to go with the test. Um, and uh, we also have heard some presentations about um, how through the standardized ontologies and that there are actually ways, you know, using check boxes that you can kind of fill in what's present and what's not present. What we don't have across all those things is an integration. And so you could imagine, uh, I could imagine, a uh, scenario where if I were in the clinic and I had a patient and I said, gosh, you know, if I fill out this form, it's going to go to the laboratory with any testing that I order. Uh, it's going to allow me to immediately pull up relevant information from all of these resources. Um, and it, it would facilitate bi-directional communication and could, in fact, uh, under appropriate permissions, uh, be deposited in something like uh, a Monarch or a ClinGen as patient-level data. If you could do all of that with filling out one form, well, now you've really got something because I get something from doing it because it makes my life easier. I'm not having to go and doing individual searches of all the resources and the value to the community is, is, uh, is evident. So uh, that again is another sophisticated uh, informatics uh, solution and intero interoperability problem. Uh, but if we don't get the value proposition right, uh, other than the few altruists, which don't represent even a small army, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're not going to make much progress. All right, Wendy was given. <laughs> I'll be really quick because I'm just building on what Bruce said and what Mark said, and I realize we're drinking the same Kool Aid for a long time. Um, but just to, to build, this really is about a value proposition, and I think all the tools are there. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm looking in part of the value proposition is is getting accreditation, of course, and looking at Mike. Um, but but I but I think that uh, it can be, be even better than that because it, it kind of comes down to who pays for these genetic tests really, um, and can you even order it, which is uh, kind of a big no in some um, uh, in many circumstances. So it it it, it means that we have to uh, partner uh, with the payers, and I think we have to go beyond CMS to to do that. But uh, there there is a you know increasing interest in the payers participating and FDA participating in this whole endeavor, which I think we can leverage. Um, now, it's not too much, I think, to ask a clinician who is ordering a genetic test to enter in uh, one, two, three, four phenotypes that become part of this collection. And then the benefit for the payers is, um, number one, you have a narrower gene list. As long as you're not in the discovery phase, you're talking about genes with known phenotypes. Um, and then you can get that to be iterative once you have a result back and you have a variant that pathogenic, the U.S., but you can recategorize it. So um, I'm just saying to extend this uh, discussion 
to uh, really the whole kind of ecosystem of, um, of people that meet, need, need to help us to build it. So this is really awesome. I hate to do this. Um, we do have a discussion. We have a panel. So those of you who didn't get to comment right now, hold the thoughts, bring them back up when we have the panel discussion. We have plenty of time then to, to continue this because I think this is a really important trend of discussion. Um, but now um, I really want to turn this over to um, Bob Nussbaum, who's um, online and is not a hologram, unfortunately. Uh, and he's going to um, uh, give a talk, which the title has changed to something very interesting just before lunch. <laughs> so, and, and I might just mention, if, if Melissa got the Hero Award, Bob gets the second Hero Award um, uh, for, for doing this remotely for us. And, and while it may be even more tempting to uh, you know, scan through your email and that because he's not here looking at us, um, he's going to give us a hint as to where he's, he's buried a million dollars, and it'll be in his slides. So, so you, you want to look carefully at those. Bob, go ahead. It is four boards. They got flooded. That's right. Exactly. 